For the rest of us, we can turn over to, to the book of Acts in chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. I got to say, the, uh, so far, the first week of retirement, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it, all right? So, so if, you, if you're in a position to, and you're contemplating, do you want do it, you know? Now, don't get me wrong, I've been busy, it's been, but it's been, uh, it's been rewarding to be up here uh, during the week, working, doing the things uh, for the ministry. And uh, I've really enjoyed this past week, so just praying for many weeks ahead. So anyway, today we're going to resume our study in the book of Acts, and we're going to continue to learn about the church. The church being the, the body of believers that began on the day of Pentecost. Remember the day of Pentecost? Peter preached, and uh, the, the, the people received the Holy Spirit, and there was 3,000 people added to the church that day. Man, uh, what a day that must have been, huh? What a day that must have been. And so... Uh, we know, we know that we have a large, uh, a large church. You know, we're sitting here this morning, we've got a small number of people, but I want you to know that we are part, the, the, the church that we belong to is massive. There's uh, millions of people in the church. So sometimes I know we adopt this small church mentality, but that's not us. That's not us. Uh, we're part of that big body of, of Jesus Christ. And so uh, that all began on the day of Pentecost. And as we've gone through our study of the first century church, uh, all that was new. All of it was new. Uh, there were no church manuals. There were no Christian traditions at the time for them to lean back on. And so for these new converts, these Jewish converts, these, these Gentile converts, they were trying to figure out their way, okay? And, and I have found uh, this study to be so uh, enlightening, and, and I see it in, in people's lives today. Maybe someone that didn't grow up in the church. Maybe someone that's a new convert. Maybe someone that has been out of church for a long time. Matter of fact, we were singing, uh, as we were singing the hymns this morning, I was looking up there, and I was looking at that word redemption. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe sometimes because we've gone to church our whole life and, uh, and maybe because we, we, we kind of get numb to some of the words that you hear coming out of the pulpit, coming out of our hymnals. And so we don't really think about, we kind of get mechanical in the way we sing our hymns and we're not listening to the message. And so that word redemption, and I got to think, I said, man, I wonder if my congregation is, is looking at that word redemption and thinking about what it means in their life. You have been redeemed. You have been redeemed. Jesus Christ has died on the cross for you, and he has paid the penalty of sin for your life. All right? You, if, uh, you, know, you can be uh, born twice and die once, or you can be born once and die twice. You don't want to do that. Uh, we want you to spend eternity in heaven. So that word redemption this morning just kind of jumped out at me, and I thought, wow, uh, I hope the church is paying attention. I hope we don't get numb uh, to the, the things of, of, of Christ and the words that have so much meaning to us, like redemption, salvation, repentance. So the new church, the new church was overwhelmingly Jewish, and there was a lot, a lot of learning to do. Maybe the Jews were at a, a greater disadvantage, I don't know, because they had... Uh, a ton of, of laws and traditions and all these things, these feasts, the dietary restrictions, all these things that they had to uh, learn to overcome and to weed through to find, figure out well, what's really uh, meaningful for a Christian or what, what is my Jewish tradition. But Christian, the new Christian converts, they would soon learn that all, all men were going to be given an opportunity to become part of God's eternal church. Jews to include the Samaritans, which they considered to be kind of a half-breed, if you will, and then the Gentiles were going to be welcomed to the church. So this was a difficult transition for um, everyone involved. The Jews were God's chosen people, and as such, the, the truth is they are a little bit arrogant about it. And now they're going to have to learn to be accepting of non-Jews. Now, again, remember they hated the Samaritans because the Samaritans uh, under captivity have intermarried with uh, all these idol worshipers and brought in all these false doctrines and what have you. And then you got uh, the Gentiles who they refer to like they think dogs. So they couldn't stand these people. Now all of a sudden uh, they're becoming part of their church family. So uh, they had to learn. They had to learn to uh, put aside their prejudices. 
But the Gentiles and, and, and the Samaritans on the other side of the fence, they were going to have to set aside their fear of the Jews because the, the Jews had, had persecuted them for so many uh, centuries and had uh, constantly uh, referred to them as less than human. And so the Gentiles and Samaritans, they were going to have to overcome uh, their fear and their prejudice towards the Jews. So there's all these emotions, there's all these this history that they got to overcome, and they over, the only way they're ever going to be able to overcome it is to fully trust in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. You see, because they're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love one another. And in order to do that correctly, we have to just be a conduit, a channel by which God's love flows through us to one another. That's how we're supposed to love each other. All right? It's not based on whether or not I approve of you. It has nothing to do with approval. It has nothing to do with my judgment of anyone. It has to do with the fact that I claim to be a child of God, and as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, I'm supposed to love you because he loves me. Understand? Because his love should be so overwhelming, over, so overpowering, and so overflowing that you've got to let it spill out on somebody. It might as well be your brothers and sisters in Christ. It might as well be that lost sinner in the, in, in the workplace or what have you. So we want to uh, understand that these people are, are trying to learn these things and are trying to overcome their, their uh, prejudices, the things that they had been taught and had grown up with. It. In chapter 15... We read how false doctrines threatened the health of the church as certain Jews began to teach that the Gentile converts would have to be circumcised before they could be saved. In other words, they said, you're going to have to become a good Jew before you can become a good Christian. And so, of course, that stirred up all this trouble, and uh, so there was a, a tremendous amount of concern in the church. The Gentile, Gentile converts now, all of a sudden, they're fearful for their standing before God. You know, the, uh, Paul or Barnabas or whoever had led them to the Lord had done so and telling them that only faith alone, faith alone in Jesus Christ, and you can be saved. And now this group comes out of the church of Jerusalem. And remember, the church of Jerusalem was, was kind of the central hub at the time. And you had James, the brother of Jesus, or the half-brother of Jesus, who was the pastor there. And so when people came from that church and they began to say, well, you're going to have to be circumcised, that carried some weight. That carried some weight simply because of, of uh, what church they came out of. And so they began to question, so well, wait a minute, am I saved or am I not saved? All right. I hope if you're sitting here today and you have made a profession of faith that you know you're saved. You know it. Listen, I've had people through the years that have said to me, well, I'm just not sure, not sure if I'm saved. I don't feel saved. Can I say this to you? Being saved has nothing to do with your feelings. Being saved has nothing to do with your emotions. Because the Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. doesn't say you might be saved if you're in a good mood. doesn't say you might be saved if life is going uh, well for you. It doesn't say that you might be saved if you're healthy. That's not what it says. It says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And so we need to walk with that assurance in our life so that who we are, we need to know who we are in Christ. All right? Because we live through Christ. All right? We we'll live within Christ. So in chapter 15, this false doctrine began to circulate. And so Paul and Barnabas, they immediately began to refute what these guys said. No, that's not true at all. And they began to debate. And so they said, okay, we're going to go back to the church of Jerusalem, and we're going to form a council, and we're going to uh, uh, discuss these issues, and we're going to come up with an answer. And so the council was formed, and uh, after a lot of discussion and disputing, the council concluded that all men, Jews and Gentiles alike, would be saved by faith in Christ alone. Let me say this to you today. You are saved through your faith in Christ alone. Uh, it doesn't matter how much money you put in the offering plate. It doesn't matter how many Sundays you come to church in a row. It doesn't matter how you dress. It doesn't matter what you do as an occupation. Uh, your faith in Jesus Christ is what saves you. Amen? Mm. Your faith in Jesus Christ is what saves you. Amen? There. Say it like you believe it. There you go, because I want you to be sure who you are in Christ. But there were a few caveats in this council's decision. Remember, James got up, and in, in verse 19 of chapter 15, he says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornications and from things strangled and from blood. So these were practices that had been uh, instituted under the law. So why would James, who, who had just made this decision and had just clarified the fact that salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone, but now he says, well, you can't, 
uh, you got to abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. So why does he begin to throw these, these four uh, things from the law in there? James would later write in his epistle, in James chapter 2 and verse 8, says, uh, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. So this is an important principle, and you know what? As I've gone through this study, I can't tell you how this principle has spoken to me, uh, because it is all through, it is all through the, the New Testament for sure, that this royal law, loving your neighbor better than yourself and, and esteeming others better than yourself, uh, putting people before, before your concerns and not so focusing on, on your life necessarily, but paying attention to the uh, person's life next to you. The royal law is simply the law that is impressed upon us to love our neighbors as we do ourselves. So what was, one of the things that was going on is in, in the first church is, as these Jewish converts were coming, they were still worshiping in the temple. They were still observe, observing some of their feasts. They were still exercising their dietary restrictions. And so they were still doing these things. And they had done it because for centuries they had been commanded to do it. And so it was just what they were used to. And so what, what Paul is going to address uh, eventually is he's going to say to them, that, you know, it doesn't matter if you uh, eat meat or you don't eat meat. In other words, because the problem with meat was this, is that someone would take a sacrifice to the temple, they would, uh, they would slaughter it, they would uh, drain the blood, they would uh, make an offering to the Lord, and then whatever meat was left over, it would go to like, I don't know, their butcher shop or what, a temple butcher shop. And they would sell it to the public. And the Jews would not eat that meat because it had been offered before the Lord as a sacrifice. So, but the Gentiles, they had no problem with that. They had no problem with that. And, but what James was recognizing, what this council was recognizing, was that, you know what, if we continue to eat this meat, if we continue to allow the Gentiles to eat this meat, then the church is going to be divided because the Jews are always going to be offended by that because, you know, they were Orthodox Jews. That's what they've been taught to do all their life. And so they're just never going to be able to overcome that, at least not overnight. So the royal law is at play here. I'm going to do something that particularly I don't want to do or that uh, I don't have to do. It has no reflection on my salvation, but I'm going to do it for the unity of the church, for the unity of fellowship. So I'm going to put myself, my wants, my desires second. And, you know, we, we, look, we're all Americans. We, look, we grew up in a great country. We have our freedoms. And you know what? We all want to do what we want to do when we want to do it and how we want to do it. That's just our nature. And so it's, not, it's second nature at best for us to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to put myself second. You know, I don't, need to be, I don't need to be first here. And that's not necessarily where we come from all the time. So uh, while the Gentiles wouldn't have had any problem with these restrictions, uh, with the things that was going on with the diets and the festivals and what have you, the Jews would have. These, uh, these things that were mentioned in the passage, they would have been associated with idol worship in one form or the other. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, the Jews were offended uh, for those that would violate it. So James is simply saying that leave anything associated with idol worship alone because it, it brings offense to the Jews, and if it brings offense to the Jews, then there's going to be division within the church. So the lesson is obvious. There, there's going to be times as believers in Jesus Christ where we have to set away our, our rights. We have to set them off to the side in order to meet our responsibility to others. What responsibility? Well, you and I as believers in Jesus Christ, we are never to become a stumbling block uh, to unbelievers of this world or to the weak brother and sister. Let me just say a, a, a word to you about the weak brother and sister. Folks, I can't tell you, I just, I'm kind of excited because I've learned so much in studying uh, over the last several weeks this sermon. Today, I'm just going to touch the, the, the very, very tip of, of, of the heart of this subject. But when they talk about the weak brother, where we don't want to offend the weak brother, you know who the weak brother is? The weak brother so many times turns out to be that believer that you, you think, I think, are the most righteous holiest person in the church but they are legalistic in their application of God's word and that's not what God's word was designed to do God's word wasn't designed to bind us it was designed to free us and sometimes the people that they present themselves as this all knowing uh, righteous uh, believer are they're weak because they can't let go of all these things all these traditions all these 
uh, things that uh, they, they've been taught that, well, this is what a good Christian does. This is what a bad Christian does. This is what an unbeliever does. This is what a true believer does. And so uh, it's created through the years and, and from the very beginning of the church, this, this schism, this division, this divisiveness within the church body about how you do things. And you're going to hear me use the term essential and non-essential. Essential, essential uh, uh, doctrines are those that uh, address your salvation. Those are the ones that you just don't compromise on. There's, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to heaven. Now, there's, there's, there's I don't know how many dozens, hundreds of, of other religions out there that will tell you that if you go through us, you can go to heaven. You're going to all paths lead to God. Well, I used to really, really uh, get offended by that. But then I said, you know what, you're right. All paths are going to lead to God. But when you get before God, he's going to judge you based on his standards. So be sure, be sure about the standards you adopt and, and the, the pathway that you take and what have you. So we're going to see in, in the very first few verses of the 16th chapter of Acts this morning, we are going to see a great example of one who's going to set away his right, his rights as a believer, his rights as a human being. He's going to set those off to the side because he's more focused on his responsibility to the unbelieving of the world. And it's a beautiful gift that he gives. So if you would, stand with me <clears throat> as we read <clears throat> in the 16th chapter of Acts. We'll begin in verse 1, and we're just going to read through verse 5. It says, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain uh, disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the, Jew, of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they believed them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for your word, for the recordings that, that uh, our brother Luke made for us concerning the, the missionary journeys. And we're just so thankful, Lord, for the lessons that we can learn. And, and help us, Lord, to understand the difference between uh, our rights and our responsibilities, Lord. And sometimes our responsibilities uh, will override our rights, but that should be uh, a choice that we make, and it should be a choice that we do uh, uh, lovingly and easily, Lord, because our goal in this life is to do those things to bring honor and glory to your name. We ask it in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So at the end of chapter 15, we learned that there had been this dispute between Paul and Barnabas concerning the taking of John Mark on his second uh, missionary journey. John Mark was Barnabas's nephew, and Barnabas said, well, you know, we're going to take John Mark, and you remember John Mark on the first missionary journey, when they got to Pamphylia, uh, John Mark had departed. It doesn't tell us why he departed, it just says he departed. Now, evidently, it must not have been a good enough reason for Paul, because when Barnabas bring, brings it up and says, hey, we're going to take John Mark, Barnabas says, I don't think that's a good idea. And they begin to argue, and they begin to dispute, and, and they said that the dispute was so great between them that they separated. And so we know that Barnabas, he, uh, he uh, took uh, Mark, and they sailed to Cyprus. And then Paul, he chose Silas, and they went through Syria and Cilicia. And these are the areas that they had covered on their first missionary journey. They were going to go back and confirm the churches, make sure everything was going okay, make sure that uh, you know, people were, were, uh, were thriving as new believers. And so it's believed that it's been probably somewhere around five years since they had finished their first missionary journey and now they're starting their second missionary journey. I know sometimes it's hard to maintain a timeline in your, in your mind when you're reading the Bible because you go from one chapter to the next and they're already doing something that was several years separated. So here they, the scholars believe it's been about five years. So I have to admit to you that at the end of chapter 15, I was a little bit disappointed in Paul. I didn't really care uh, for Paul when he said, I'm not taking John Mark, you know, because I want, my, uh, I want my pastors and I want my leaders, I want them to be able to invest in people, I want them to take the time to mentor people. And then it seemed like to me that's, man, Paul, you're being awful harsh. I would have thought that you'd, been, you'd show more grace, that you'd be more understanding. 
but we know that Barnabas took uh, Mark, and we know that eventually down the road that uh, Paul had changed his attitude. We talked about it last week where he said that, you know, send me Mark when he was in a Roman prison. said, send me Mark because he's, he's valuable to me. He's prosperous to me in the ministry. So his whole attitude will change about Mark down the road. But in chapter 16, we, Paul redeems himself, in my mind, at least a little bit, as if that matters in, in the course of history. But it does my approval doesn't mean anything. But he kind of redeems himself in my eyes. And we read in verse 1, it says, Then came he, he being Paul, to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, or we call him Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. As Paul and Silas are traveling throughout Syria and Cilicia, they returned to those churches that had been established, and uh, they were just uh, confirming, as I said earlier, those churches were doing well, and as they visited these churches, they would have delivered that decree that had been uh, uh, decided upon in Jerusalem, that you know, through faith alone you come to Christ, and those, uh, those four items that, uh, that they were supposed to abstain from. So they would have been uh, sharing that throughout the, uh, the regions as they went, and to, so all the churches would be on the same page. As Paul's party gets in, into Derby and Lystra, we read that there's this young disciple uh, named Timotheus, and certainly we know him by as Timothy by his letters and so this is that same Timothy that Paul would later write two letters to and he also referred to him as the son, his son in the faith his son in the faith so um, Paul becomes very close to Timothy Timothy and his mother Eunice were probably saved during uh, Paul and Barnabas's first missionary journey Obviously, during Paul's absence, Timothy had grown spiritually and was somewhat of a bright star in the new church. While Timothy had been born to a father that was Greek, probably unbelieving, uh, probably not a, a, a Jewish proselyte, he probably had been born blessed to have uh, his mother and his grandmother who were true believers in, in Jesus Christ. Paul said this about his mother and grandmother in 2 Timothy 1.5. When I call to remembrance the, under, the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. You never ever want to discount the importance of a godly parent. What Paul is saying is that I'm seeing uh, this, this, this uh, amazing faith in your mother and your grandmother, and so I know that if they've got it, I'm sure that you've got it. Let me tell you something, as a, as a born again believer in Jesus Christ, as a Christian, and your kids know that you uh, come to church, listen, I've got a book that said, the title of the book is called Already Gone. And the book is about why we're losing all our young people whenever they get, uh, grow up, turn 18, move out of the house, why we're losing them out of the church. And the number one reason was, is that they did not see Christianity in their parents Monday through Saturday. They would see them, they'd get all dressed up and go to church on Sunday, and they would uh, sing the hallelujahs, and they would uh, use all that church talk, and, and you know, bless your brother, good to see your brother, hey sister, and all this other good stuff. But then on Monday morning, all that stuff disappeared. And you know what? They said, it just doesn't work. And so whenever they get out of high school and they go on their own or they go to college, and certainly if they go to a secular college, uh, their faith is going to be assaulted with all that uh, junk anyway. And so what do they do? They fall away from the church because church, and let me remind you what church is. Church has nothing to do with this building. The church has to do with, with you and what's here. That's the church because the church that they were being exposed to was not pure. And so when they got older, they, they just left. That's why it's important to have a godly mother and father. You know, I was reminded this week that I was very fortunate to have the parents that I had. Now, as I've told you many times, my dad wasn't saved until he was 60. But my dad had been raised in a godly home. And the principles that he raised us on were biblical principles. He didn't teach them to us under that premise, but they were still godly principles. My dad wouldn't tolerate uh, profanity, he wouldn't tolerate stealing, he wouldn't tolerate lying, he wouldn't tolerate disobedience to, to, to him and or mom. Uh, you want to get under my dad's skin? Talk back to mom. Dad's going to let you know it, okay? They were all biblical principles. He just didn't present it as such because he didn't understand it that way, but he had been raised with that by my grandmother. 
And my dad is a constant reminder that where uh, Scripture says, train up a child in the way that they should go when they're old, they'll not depart from it. My dad is a prime example of that. Didn't get saved until he was 60, but man, when my dad was a good moral man. Now, that wasn't going to get him to heaven, but when he came to Christ, I went, I just, first thing I thought was, man, the Word of God is true. The Word of God is, 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 is a teacher. And uh, my dad had been living by that because of my grandmother and what uh, he had been taught in that house. We're seeing the same thing probably with Timothy. Uh, it seems that during Paul's absence that Timothy had grown spiritually and he's this, now this bright star amongst the church. It said that you know, throughout these two cities that uh, it was acknowledged that he was a good man. Uh, his father was a Greek. All right, so probably again unbelieving Greek, and, and he wouldn't have he wouldn't have been uh, circumcised for for instance. And then we know that that this faith that he has is going to empower Timothy. He's going to be used throughout. He's going to be kind of like a Swiss Army knife in the ministry. He's going to be able to do everything for Paul. So at the very least, we know that Paul was probably they they they. He speculated that Timothy was probably 15, 16 years old when Paul gets his hands on him. And we think that because when you go to 2 Timothy and, and read chapter 4 and verse 12, it says that uh, Paul is telling him, he said, don't let the people in the church to despise thy youth. So he was obviously a young man. So T Timothy was well-respected even, even as a young, young man. In verse 3, we read him him meaning Timothy, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now before I get off on my main subject here, I'm going to chase this one little rabbit. And so the churches were established in the faith and increased in number daily. Just let me say to you that if we will live in the faith and in our faith in Jesus Christ, the church will grow. The church will grow. But we have to be faithful. We have to be faithful to be able to share our testimony with others, to be able to witness to others about the salvation that exists in Jesus Christ. Churches, they have to be established in faith. And if they'll do that, they'll see growth. So Paul, he's, he gets there and he sees this tremendous potential in Timothy and he recruits him to be part of his ministry team uh, as they continue to visit the churches uh, that they had established in the first uh, journey and then uh, even in regions, new regions, where the gospel had not yet been shared. In verse 3, we see that Paul had Timothy circumcised. Now, this might seem a little bit odd at first because there's no doubt in my mind, you know, Paul has just read a decree to the church. He's told him that, you know, faith alone is what saves you. And then as he, as he recognizes the talent that Timothy says, he says, Timothy, I want you to get circumcised. What? You just said. Yeah, I know, but there's another principle at hand. There's another principle at hand. Verse 3 tells us why he wants Timothy circumcised. It says that because of the Jews that were in those quarters, where they were going was, was primarily Jewish populated. So in order to get amongst the Jews, he was going to need to be circumcised so he could have access, access to them. Circumcision had been a requirement from God to acknowledge God's covenant with Abraham that the Jews would be God's chosen people. Circumcision was an indication to the Jews of their responsibility to serve as holy people whom God had called to be his chosen people. Circumcision was performed on a male child at the age of eight and served as a visible sign of the covenant between God and his people. Circumcision came to be the badge of their spiritual and national superiority. The terms circumcised and uncircumcised came to represent the division between the Jews and the non-Jews. Circumcision was a big deal to the Jews. It was a badge of honor. It was a badge. It's, it's just like if we walk around, you know, uh, people today, a lot of people wear crucifixes and, and stuff today, and, and that's kind of their badge of honor to say, I'm a Christian. They want everybody to know, hey, I'm a Christian. And, but with the Jews, circumcision was so, so important. It was so important to the Jews that in order for a Jewish male to enter the temple, he had to be circumcised. 
for Timothy to be able to move freely among the Jews, to be able to converse with the Jews, to engage with the Jews, Paul's saying, you need to get circumcised. You need to get circumcised. Now, think about this. Timothy had the right. Timothy could have said, could have said simply to Paul, uh, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that at all. Because you just got done saying. And I don't know about you, and I don't mean to, you know, but I'm just thinking, ouch. All right? I'm not doing that. But he didn't say that. Paul's telling him, Timothy, if you want to fulfill your call, your call as a, as a pastor, as an evangelist, as, as a witness of Jesus Christ, you're going to need to get circumcised so you can move around in this community of unbelievers. Have you ever thought about what you might have to give up in order to move around in the community of unbelievers in order to share the gospel? You definitely might have to give up some of your comfort. You might have to go into a neighborhood that you're, you're, you're fearful for your safety. You might have to uh, be exposed to things that are strange to you, that are foreign to you. I can tell you right now, when I went to, went to Cuba, that was, that was strange to me. Uh, some of the things that I saw and, and some of the things they did, they don't do things, everything like we do it. And because people don't do things the way you and I do it, then that becomes strange. It becomes odd. It becomes, in some people's mind, it becomes uh, sinful. Well, you didn't do it the way I did it. And obviously the way I do it is the righteous way to do it. So if you're not doing it my way, then you must be wrong. Man, we got to be real, real careful with that thinking. we got to be real careful. Because you know what you just did? You just divided God's church. And I don't think God's happy when his church is divided. All right. Listen, we can have we can have different standards. We can have different opinions. We can have different goals, you know. But those things shouldn't divide us. They shouldn't divide us. You know, I always use the red carpet, blue carpet analogy, and there's a reason why I do, because there's been churches that have split over the color of the paint or the carpeting or the pews or whatever. And as I've always reminded you that if we take a vote between red and blue, you're a blue fan, but red wins the vote. Now, guess what? You're a fan of red, all right? Because it's the decision of the church. And if it's a member of the church, that's what you promote. You don't go out into the world and say, man, they put red carpeting in the church. It looks terrible. It clashes. I would have never chosen red. Yeah, that's not what you do. What you do is you go out and you say, hey, man, we got new red carpet. It looks great. You need to come look at that. And while you're there, you can hear the gospel. That's what your attitude should be. So we've got to be careful about how we apply some of these things. Timothy had the right to say no. But he also had a more pressing responsibility to preach the gospel to the lost. If Timothy had refused circumcision, he would not have been allowed the necessary access to the people, the Jewish people, to preach the gospel. You and I have the right to do many things in this life. In fact, Paul said in his letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 23, he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to, or for me, but all things edify not. Paul could have eaten meat that had been offered to idols, for example, which is one of the issues that was taking place in the church. But how was that going to benefit the church? His diet had no impact on a person's salvation. If I eat meat, it's not, not going to save you. If I don't eat meat, it isn't going to save you. If I eat meat, it's not going to condemn you. If I don't eat meat, it's not going to condemn you. But I will set aside my desire to eat meat if it will improve our fellowship and if it will keep the unity in the church. And unity and unified this can sometimes be, you know, we can all be in a room together, but we may not have the same thoughts. We might have the, not have the same motive or goal in mind. Paul's saying that all these things are lawful for me, but they're not expedient. In other words, what good do they do? What good do they do? I've heard people use this verse to expand their Christian liberty into areas that I believe to be sinful. Paul, like I said, could have done these things, but he chose not to. And I've seen too many times that the fellowship in the church was disrupted because of disagreements re regarding some non-essential belief. Again, non-essential, not impacting salvation. Listen, folks, through the years, we've had, uh, we've had people that have had disputes in here about uh, Christmas, uh, a Christmas tree, Christmas decorations. They didn't want to see anything like that in the, in the sanctuary. And as you know, I, I, I got no problem with that. Uh, but we've had people that 
would fall on their sword, so to speak, over issues like that. Uh, other people that I can remember as a, as a young man, you know, some of the things, some of the standards that were enforced in the church that you, you just, the truth is it really didn't have any impact on salvation didn't have any impact. And those are the things that we've got to look at. You and I, as believers, will on occasion need to forego our rights to do certain things to help an unbeliever or a weak believer come to faith or maintain their faith. When I was about 21, 22, stationed in Alaska, I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip up into the Arctic to a, a tribe of Eskimos. And so when the pr- preacher first uh, told me about it, I was excited, said, yeah, I'd love to go do that. And you know, I'm thinking I'm gonna learn all kinds of stuff. And then as we were talking, uh, he said, well, you can't take any money with you because that'll offend them. I said, well, it's easy, I don't have any money. And, uh, but I made just an offhand comment. I said, you know what? I said, pastor, as long as I don't have to eat well, blubber, we'll be good. And he kind of leaned in on the table and he went, oh, you'll eat well, blubber. And I leaned back and went, oh, no, I won't. And you know what? I didn't go. I didn't go because I was not going to eat whale blubber. Now, those of you that have known me for a while, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm picky about what I eat and how I eat, where I eat, and the conditions within I, how I eat and all that stuff. I just, it wasn't that, I, I don't think I was being prideful. I just, I thought, man, if I take a bite of whale blubber, I'm going to get sick. I'm not going to, I'm just not going to be able to do it. Physically, I didn't think I could do it. But I always regretted that decision. So fast forward to 2003, I had an opportunity to go on a short-term mission trip to Cuba for about four or five days. And back in those days, I was having migraines like four or five days a week and uh, just wasn't doing well with those. And, but this opportunity came up and I just began to pray, Lord, just let me go, let me go a week without a headache, please. I want to go, I want to do this. I want to overcome my fears and do this. And so I went to Cuba. The meals were challenging. The conditions sometimes were challenging. And there were some things that I wouldn't eat, okay? I'll be honest with you. I, the, the very first message I preached on that Sunday was like in, a, like in an old folks' home. And afterwards, we went up on like the roof, and they had this buffet set out. And uh, they had this, uh, evidently they liked mayonnaise. Because there was a lot of casseroles or like macaroni salad, stuff like that. But Number one, I don't care for that stuff anyway, but I had no idea how long that had been sitting out there. I mean, I got there like at 9 or 10, it's now 1, and I'm thinking, how long has this stuff been sitting out there? And I'm trying to be careful not to get sick while I'm there, and all these good things. But the point being is, is that despite some of the challenges that I did have to, have to put aside my, my personal preferences, I was changed from going to that mission field and learning what these uh, Cuban pastors, what their day was like, and, and the, uh, uh, some of the things that they had to overcome every single day. I mean, they spent their days trying to feed their people, find their people medical attention, and, and things of that nature. Uh, they, they, had, they had their hands full every single day. And so, yes, I'm glad I did that because I did learn so much. Timothy had the right not to be circumcised. But he also had the right to be circumcised if it would give him access to those Jews that were lost. So, a matter of perspective. I have met Christians where they're living a negative Christianity. And let me explain what I mean to you by that. Because the way that they address their Christianity, because of they're a Christian, they'll say, well, I can't do this, and I can't do that. I can't, I can't, I can't. And so they're presenting to the world, you know, Christianity is just a whole list of rules, and just, and all it does is keep you from having fun. It just keeps you from enjoying life and all that. Rather than the believer that has a positive attitude and says things like, well, because of my salvation in Christ, I no longer have the desire to do that. I no longer want to do those things. I don't want to do the things that Jesus isn't glorified in. And so now I have a new perspective. So Timothy had the right perspective. He could have adopted the perspective of, of this is my right. I'm not surrendering my right. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and he would have been fine to do that. That's fine. 
But instead, he said, you know what? I'm going to forget about my rights. I'm going to get circumcised because my burning desire is to go preach the gospel to the lost Jews of the world. And so I'm going to do this because I want to do this, because I want to be a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's a matter of your perspective. Oh, I don't really want to do this. Preacher's got this, this visitation schedule. I don't really want to do that. I don't want to do that. And you have the right to not do it. But as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, someone that has experienced God's love, someone that's been rescued from hell, somebody that's been redeemed, I would think that there would be a deep desire for you to say, but I want my loved one, I want my co-worker to receive Christ because I don't want them to face the same thing that, that I faced before either. And so I want, I want to do these things. And then sometimes we have to look at it and say, you know, well, preacher asked me to do this, and, you know, I, I don't really care for that. Uh, he says it'll help, it'll help our, our young converts if I do this. And uh, I don't have the time. I don't want to take the time, uh, whatever. Instead of, I got a chance to help new converts. I got to help to grow people spiritually. I get a chance to invest. Listen, folks, one thing we do as Christians is we invest ourselves in one another. And let me tell you what, that investment sometimes will hurt. You will pour your life into somebody, and you will give them all that you got. You will love them. You will counsel with them. You will encourage them, and then they'll turn around and bite your hand. It's kind of like that new puppy we got, all right? But then there's times where you, you put your time into them. You pray with them. You pray for them. You, you, you help them all you can, and you sit back, and you listen. I've told you this before. Sometimes when I get discouraged, I come in here, and I sit right here. I sit right here, and I begin to go pew by pew, and I remind myself of what's going on in people's lives, how well they're doing, or how they're growing, and the challenges that they've overcome, or maybe they had a, a health issue they had to overcome. And so I will go pew by pew, and I will walk my way all around this church, and I will think to myself, say, God, you're good. You are really good. You have given me a good church family. And sometimes, I, and I'm, I'm just honest with you, sometimes I just say, Lord, they're doing the best they can. They're doing their best they can. Would you please bless them? Please give them something that, that says to them, say, I'm watching your efforts, I'm watching your hearts, I'm listening to you, and just, just give us something to get a little bit of encouragement from. Let us do that. And it works for me, it works for me um, to remind myself of exactly what I have because of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul, one day, would write about judgments among the church. The church in Rome was experiencing many of the same issues that the other churches had experienced or were experiencing. Primarily was the discord that would arise when the uh, Jewish uh, Christian converts would make judgments concerning the worthiness of their Gentile convert brothers based on their lack of adherence to traditions of the law. So over in the book of Romans, Paul writes this, beginning in verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. While the Christian Jews were judging their Gentile brothers concerning their disregard for the law, the Gentile converts were judging their Jewish brothers because they had not fully understood or embraced the salvation was based on faith alone. These differences were creating a division in the church. Paul's message was this, that every believer was going to stand before God one day to give an account of how they lived their life. Our lives should be lived with a sincere conviction based upon the word of God. I might have a sincere conviction that you don't have. Yet when I stand before God, I will not be judged based on your standards or beliefs. But I will be, ba I will be judged based on what does God's word say. We need to understand as believers that in the areas, non-essential areas, that I might have a standard. Listen, I, I've, met a, I've met a few of these guys. I used to have a guy that, it came across to me anyway, maybe it was in his heart, but it came across to me, he would brag to me that he didn't have a TV in his house. 
And he was letting me know that, you know, hey, I'm up here. I don't watch TV. I was like, man, that's, that's a great standard. I'm glad you can live that way. Me, I watch TV. I watch TV. Maybe sometimes I watch too much, but I do try to, try to watch, you know, good stuff. But maybe some of y'all would judge it not to be good, uh, depending on your standard. But this was his standard. But this guy was constantly telling me that he had marked this person, and by marking he means that he had identified them as a problem for the church and for him, and that he was no longer associated with them. And he would do this constantly. And I said to him one time, I said, I said, you do a lot of marking of people. So you know, the Bible says that we as believers are supposed to have a spirit of reconciliation. We're supposed to be reconciling people with God, not shoving them aside, not pushing them away because they watch TV or whatever. And so this conversation was a weekly conversation. And finally one day, you know, one of his sticking points was, uh, was alcohol. And so I looked at him one day and I just said, I said are, are you having this issue because you drink? And when I said that, he went just like this. I drink one beer a day. And I said, okay. I said, but what do I do with the guy that drinks two beers a day? He didn't have an answer. See, his standard was one beer. But what if your standard is two beers? Or a six-pack or a case? Look, I used to have a good friend when I was in the Army. That dude could drink a case. That was his standard. So what do I do with that? And so we're, we're talking and all this, you know, and I'm just trying to understand. Truly, I'm just trying to understand. So then he's telling me, well, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no, I said, okay, fine. I'm not telling you. I don't believe you're going to go to hell because you drank a beer. I said, I don't believe that. I said, but let me ask you this. Would you witness to an unbeliever with a Budweiser in your hand? Oh, no, I would never do that. Well, why not? You just told me there's nothing wrong with it. We, uh, yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, he... I think you just answered your own question. If it's not something that you're going to do in the open, then there must be a problem with it. Must be a problem with it. The bottom line is, my standard may not be your standard. Doesn't necessarily mean that my standard is righteous and yours is unrighteous, but that's the way many, many believers present themselves. And we have to be careful with that because it can cause divisiveness. And listen, you notice what I'm not wearing? I haven't been wearing I haven't been wearing ties for a while. Do you know why? Because as I've been studying this, I've been getting convicted about the people I'm not getting the opportunity to preach to. I asked a, I asked my mentor in the Lord last year, I talked to him and I said, Hey, am I not getting the opportunity to preach to people simply because I wear a tie? And he's a guy that goes around and he's like, Yeah. And he goes, I hate to tell you this, but you are. You're losing opportunity. Man. And that began to play on me. And I began to read. I began to study. And I'm like, got to be careful with this. Got to be careful with this. Years ago, several years ago, I moved the organ up. Got rid of the organ. I did it for two reasons. Number one, we needed the space. Number two, I'd been here for I don't know how many years. I only heard it played once. I mean, I started coming here when I was 12. Once, maybe twice, I heard that thing played. And I think both times it was by someone who was a, a guest here. So I moved it out. Nobody said a word, except for one person, and that was my mom. And that's when, it, when she was suffering with dementia. And, you know, and I thought, of all people, I said, Mom, good for you. You, you, you. She's like, I don't know if she was just letting me know, hey, I saw what you did, you know. And then I got rid of the thrones. I got rid of the thrones. You remember the big, oh, soft, beautiful, they're beautiful chairs, but if you ever had to sit in one, they were extremely uncomfortable. And I didn't like the looks of them because they were thrones. Because I'm not your king. Nobody that's up here is your king. So I didn't like them. So I just sat back here in this closet back here. And I'm in the process of trying to replace this, this big hulking pulpit that makes me look like a judge. Because I don't want to be seen as your judge. I want to be seen as your pastor. I want to be seen as your brother in Christ. I want to be seen as someone that loves you and is trying to counsel you, you want to direct you, and to pray for you, and to guide you. So to a closer relationship with the Lord, that's what I'm trying to do. 
And so as we go on, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see a transition in this church because I'm transitioning, because I'm studying and I'm praying and I'm asking God for wisdom, for guidance. Because I don't want anyone to walk through those doors back there and feel uncomfortable, all right, because of uh, arbitrary standards that we have set forth. So we've got to be careful with those things. We've got to be careful with them in our personal lives. Um, but let me say this to you, too. There's the flip side of that argument. I just heard a guy this week, because uh, during the week uh, I try to listen to some sermons, especially on my morning walks. And, you know, this guy began to talk, you know, he was, he was putting himself up on a pedestal because he wore ratty-tatty jeans in the pulpit. He was talking about somehow, you know, he was superior because he was so humble he could wear ratty jeans. Well, those ratty jeans aren't a, a result of old age. Those ratty jeans are because you went to the store and you bought designer jeans that someone had slashed up and charged you an extra 50 bucks for that when I was a kid, it was an embarrassment to have, you know, because the knees would always wear out in your blue jeans and the mom would put that big blue jean patch on it. Oh my goodness, it was horrifying, horrifying. You didn't walk around. And, and again, that was just how I grew up. I'm not telling you it's sinful. I'm just saying, don't tell me that you're more uh, holy than me because I don't like holes in my britches, all right? But there's people out there with that attitude. They say, well, I'm wearing, I'm wearing ratty jeans in the pulpit, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm humble. No, you're not. You're arrogant. No, no, you're arrogant. That's like this, this uh, non-denominational churches. They're all like, well, we're non-denominational. We just teach the Bible. Oh, well, I'm free will Baptist. We, we teach heresy. Is that, what you're well, is that what you're saying? And all these non-denominational churches, they are a denomination because they all have the same mindset. We used to have a group in town, they were non-denominational, they would sit outside the church on these little cafe tables and smoke their cigarettes and drink their, uh, their alcohol and whatever and while they were worshiping and all this stuff. And, and they did so, and, and listen, that's their business. But here's the thing, if I walked by in my suit, they would point at me and go, oh, yeah, he's one of those guys. You mean a guy that gets up in the morning and gets dressed? Is that what you're saying? You know, I, just, I dress differently from, than you, or you dress differently from me. That doesn't, that shouldn't do anything with our fellowship. That has nothing to do, should have nothing to do with our fellowship. But evidently it does with some groups. And I just want to be clear about this. It's on both sides of the fence. It's both sides of the fence. You got those guys in their three-piece suits and they think they're here. And then you got the guy over here in, in flip-flops and, and shorts. And he's thinking that he's up here because he's humble and he's pious. All right. So somewhere in the middle, I'm sure, is where we ought to be meeting. I think too often that believers believe that their way is the only way in the eyes of God. And so they look down on the beliefs of others. And in doing so, they've, they've taken this prideful position of superiority, which eventually will result in the division of the body of Christ. Paul said this over in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, <clears throat> but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. My walk with the Lord is not your walk. Your walk is not my walk, all right? But what it says is that no matter what path we're on, that we're supposed to work, work it out. A lot of people, they just kind of bebop around in life. You know, they, they uh, went to church as a kid. They just do what mom told them or what dad told them or what the preacher said. And they haven't opened a Bible. They haven't opened up a commentary. They haven't spent time in prayer. They haven't put any work into their salvation. They don't know what they believe. So they're over here talking to this group, and they're going, oh, that sounds pretty good. And then they go over here and talk to this group, and they're anti that. And they're like, oh, that sounds pretty good. And they're tossed to and fro. And so they don't have any strength in their walk. They don't have any power in their walk. They don't have any power in their witness. Because one day they're over here and the next day they're over there. There's nothing more confusing to me I, is I have people that will come to me and say, I believe the Holy Spirit's asking me to do this. Great. It's always great to have the Holy Spirit directing you. But then like two weeks later, it's like, ah, I really think the Holy Spirit's telling me not to mess with that anymore. I need to be over here. And I'm like, wait a minute. There's one thing that I'm 100% sure of is that the Holy Spirit is not confused. The Holy Spirit is sure about what, they, what he wants in your life. And so we just got to be in a place to hear him. We got to be able to listen to him. We got to be able to dissect what my wants and desires are from the wants and desires of the Holy Spirit for me in my life. I 
I might have <clears throat> different standards. In Romans 14, 13, it says, Let us not judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fail in his brother's way. You and I are free to live our lives as we want to or as we believe we should. However, we are to be mindful of our responsibility to our fellow brothers and sisters. Look, it's not, it's not necessarily your job to, if you see water spilt on the hallway back there on our linoleum floor and you know it's a slip hazard, it's not your job to clean it up. All right? You have the right not to. But I would think as a person who cares for anyone else, a child or, or elder person alike, you would grab a paper towel or a mop or you would clean it up because you don't want them to get hurt. You don't want them to come by and slip on it. All right? You don't have to do it. But I think you got a responsibility to do it because you noticed that the hazard was there and we should remove that hazard. I think there's a responsibility there that we, we shouldn't ignore. So we're free to do that, to live as way. But I'm not allowed to use my Christian liberty as a stumbling block to someone else. As an example, you know, Karen and I, we don't normally attend movies. Haven't you know, um, I say normally, it's not that I don't ever go, but here recently over the last couple of years, the, this group's gotten in touch with me and, and they send me an uh, invitation to go and preview movies, faith, faith-based faith movies normally. <clears throat> and so we'll go and we'll see those. And then once in a blue moon, there'll be something in the theater that, that I'll want to go see. And, and it's usually something about, you know, uh, maybe the Passion of Christ or something like that. <clears throat> and so we'll go. Where, but my honest thing is, is I try to avoid those things because I'm like, man, I don't like want to support the industry, blah, 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 and all that good stuff. So I personally, we just don't. And you know what? It hasn't impacted our life. <clears throat> we don't sit around on Friday night and go, man, I wish I could go to the movie, but someone might see me. I'm the pastor, you know, and all. It, it would be chaotic. No, that's not why. It's just a standard that we have. But it doesn't mean, because I have that standard, that if you go to the movie today, and that you're going to go to hell. That that's, doesn't have anything. My standard has nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with it. And if I see you coming out of the movie theater, I promise you I'm not going to say, well, <laughs> well, that tells me a lot. No, that's not one of the, no. Now, if I saw you coming out of a porno place, then maybe I would. All right, I'm going to be honest with you. I think then I'd be, I'd probably tap you on the shoulder and say, I saw you. I was teasing with Karen one time because we were up in, Nashville for a conference and it's Sunday evening and we're driving around there's nothing open Look, they, on Sundays up there they shut everything down man it's like so we're driving around it's like six o'clock everything's closed and we're just checking things out well there's a there's this porno shop uh, on this thing and at first glance you're thinking okay well, there's like a kind of a department store or something like that and the name of it was Genesis and I said, oh, maybe it's a Bible bookstore. Well, guess what? It wasn't a Bible book. Not because we walked in and got, no. But, but I thought to myself, I said, oh, man. I said, you know, uh, you got to be careful about these things. If you have to be waltzing, thinking I'm going into a Bible bookstore, and whoa, turn around and get out of here real quick. But so I was kind of teasing some of the guys. I said, man, you got some weird names for your uh, sinful places up here. Genesis, really? Uh, but anyway, I digress. My standard has nothing with, to do with your salvation. Your standard has nothing to do with mine. Now, don't get me wrong. If I see you uh, stumbling uh, out of a bar somewhere, and I mean stumbling, and then I'm going to ask you, hey, well, what's going on here? All right, but I'm going to do it out of love. I'm going to do it out of concern, you know. But we have to be careful with that. We have to be careful with the way that we apply our standards in regards to looking at others. Um, as I said, I've met those, and they'll, they'll check you off. He says in verse 19, he says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. So listen to what Paul's saying here. <clears throat> we are to strive for peace. We're to work towards peace. To pursue avenues that allow unity and harmony among the brethren. Dietary concerns were the issue here. Paul made it clear that the eating of meat would have no impact on the work of God. But 
If I were to sit and eat meat knowing that it offended our brother or sister, then I have sinned and facilitated a hardship in the ministry. If you're sitting next to someone and you know they're offended by you eating pork, then don't throw a big pork chop on the plate and sit down next to them and have at it if you know that it's going to offend them. You can, you can do something else. Eat a salad that day or, or wait till later to eat, whatever. Don't do something that you know is going to trip them up. All right? Now, listen, I'm not talking about... <clears throat> we all know how much I love broccoli. Uh, right? You all know how much I love broccoli? I'm not talking about when Karen orders broccoli and sits across the table from me in the restaurant. I'm like, oh, that's disgusting. Get away from me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where you know because of some deep-held beliefs that it's offensive to them. All right. And I know I tell you all the time I don't eat broccoli because I was raised in a Christian home, but I'm just teasing you. All right. Uh, there's nothing, there's nothing, as far as I know, sinful with broccoli. Uh, do what you want. Uh, there will be times when we must put, we have to put, interest or concerns of others ahead of our own. In Philippians 2.3 it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. When we do something, it's not to have a, mo a motive of strife with another believer. You're not supposed to be uh, doing something to give someone, you know, their comeuppance or whatever you want to say, or to show them up or to put them down or to embarrass them. That should never be your goal. And I got news for you. If that's your goal, you're trying to attack the weak part of, of a believer, then you have sinned because you have failed to preserve the peace and unity of the church. That is the, listen, each one of you are a part of the body of Christ, the local body of Christ here at Truth Free Will Baptist Church. You are part of that body. If I do anything to damage the body, then I have sinned. Listen, uh, one thing I have learned in life is, man, I want my body to function as efficiently as it can. Because when something gets hurt or something, you know, gets uh, uh, sick or whatever, the body doesn't function like it should. We need the body to function like it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be an efficient body. And that means every one of us in, in unity and, and in fellowship. And doesn't mean that there's not different take. Look. Not everybody, in the, if I walk out in that parking lot, not everybody's driving a Chevy. And it's okay for me to accept your sinful pursuits, all right? <laughs> so, so, you know, I've got my wife out there driving a Ford for crying out loud, you know. But the thing is, the thing is, is that my standards, the thing I choose to do, has nothing to do with what you're required to do in life. It has nothing to do with it. Nothing. And uh, we need to be mindful, mindful of how we treat others. What Paul was saying in this letter is, is that I'm supposed to put your concerns ahead of mine. If I can do something to help you in your spiritual growth, then I should do it. Even if I think that it's... Uh, uh, Maybe I think that it's, it's, it's not important, but it's important to you. It's important to you. Then I need to look at it that way, and I need to understand. You ever heard the, the saying, perception is reality? You know, everybody has their reality. Everybody has their perception, and it is their reality. And so we have to do our best to understand that. I can't be doing anything. You shouldn't be doing anything with the motive of strife towards another. Uh, our actions should never be designed to hurt fellow brother or the the opportunity of an unbeliever our motive for everything we do is supposed to be designed to please God if we would keep that in mind just think how powerful the church would be today if everything we did was done with the idea that this will be this will be pleasing to God if we will solely focus on pleasing our Lord then we will do well to never injure another person again and I know sometimes we do things ignorantly. We don't know that we've offended. And, and maybe because if you're like me, sometimes I get so busy and I get so single-minded in a task or something that I mess up over here somewhere because I'm not really paying attention to it. And that's on me. And that's on me. Because I need to pay attention to what's going on over here. I need to pay attention to what's going on in each other's lives. This mindset 
of Christ is to put others ahead of himself. He went to the cross. He died for our sins. Timothy's circ uh, uh, circumcision was an excellent example of him esteeming the eternal souls of those lost Jews more than his rights, more than his freedom not to be circumcised. Paul's mindset was that he was going to do whatever was the best thing for the ministry. Whatever he could do to win the loss to the Lord, Paul was going to do that. Paul was a man that had been, he had been beaten, he had been shipwrecked, he had been imprisoned. Uh, when I say beaten, I'm talking about beaten with rods. They say that when he was in the Mamertine prison, it was just like a deep, deep pit. All right? I've never seen it myself, but they describe this thing as, as it had to be disgusting, depressing, certainly confining. Paul went through that time and time again, being in prison and beaten. Why? So he could continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, so he could continue to reach people. And Paul could have turned the other way. I say he could, but the truth is, Paul said that he became a servant to all. And you know what motivated him to be that servant to all? Was that he realized he had a deep understanding of what salvation meant for him. That he had been rescued from the depths of hell for all eternity. And because of that rescue, he wanted to make sure everybody else in the world had an opportunity to be rescued as well. Listen, we all have power, we all have influence to some degree. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, well, not me, I'm a nobody. No, everybody's somebody in the eyes of Jesus. See how I just worked our theme into that? Isn't that good? Everybody's somebody in the eyes of Jesus. And it's important for you to remember that for yourself. Because not only does Jesus love me, but Jesus wants me to have a, a good life. He said that I came that, they came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. He doesn't want me to just kind of live and bounce around through life. and all. He wants me to have an abundant life. But that abundancy comes in living in him. That's where that abundancy comes from. But it also should remind us that, remind me, for instance, that you, and you, and you, all right, you are somebody in the eyes of Jesus. You're important. If you're important to Jesus, then you should be important to me. Because you were so important that he died for you. And so it may mean that you have to be so important to me that on occasion I have to inconvenience myself or I have to set aside my rights in order to meet my responsibilities, certainly as your pastor and certainly as a brother in Christ. I think that when I was very young, thank God, I learned that situations can always be worse. The Army taught me that. When I thought that, man, I couldn't be any more miserable, they would find a new way to make me feel more miserable. And so I kind of learned that, that things can always be worse than they are right now. But if I look over and see someone suffering, and I can ease that suffering, the Bible says, to him that knows to do good and do it not, it is a sin. So if I recognize that and I don't do it, then guess what? And I have the, and I have the ability that I sinned. I sinned. Now, that's my sin. It might, might, might be your sin because you don't recognize the need, but I do. So I have to act. I have to be the somebody at that point. We have to be careful how we respond to one another, how we look at one another. And, you know, Jesus himself taught, you know, judge not lest you be judged. But just a few verses later, he says that we're supposed to... Uh, we're supposed to identify, I'm paraphrasing now, to identify the false teachers amongst us. So in one verse he says, don't be a judge. And then in another verse he says, you're going to have to make some judgments. The difference is this. What he's saying is, you can't, I can't judge you with condemnation. All right? Number one, I don't have the power to condemn anyone. That's not my job. But it is my job to discern whether or not I should be associating with you or if I should be adhering to your teachings or whatever because I've discerned that man, maybe you're not a godly person. And I'm just using that in a general sense, okay? I'm not pointing it. When I point, I'm not pointing at you, all right? Point. But we have to understand we have to make judgments in life. 
because that's that's how we get through I have to decide is that sinful is it not sinful is that a powerful thing to do or is that a weak thing to do what am I doing in life so I can't judge you with condemnation but I can look at you and say you know what my, my brother needs my prayer because something's going on or my sister she needs me to uh, to pray for her or give her a word of encouragement There's some people that that comes natural to, but I was just thinking, Brother Don, when I said that, I was just thinking about Brother Don. You know, Brother Don, every time he walked in this place, man, he would always, he would always take an opportunity to encourage me. Uh, I've got others in the church that they will send me cards or they will send me an email or a text or something and let me know that they're praying for me or whatever. You know, they're just being encouraging. And that's powerful. It's powerful. And I hope it shows on Sundays in the, in the Word when I preach it. Hi, I'm Pastor D, and I pastor Truth Free Will Baptist Church right here in Titusville, Florida at 5311 Barna Avenue. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to wish you a happy new year and that we're praying that all of God's good blessings will be with you throughout the year. Pray for good health, pray for prosperity, and peace and joy in the lives of yourself and as well as your family. I would want to encourage you if you haven't made it back to church yet because of COVID and, and all these things as we've been going through, uh, to prayerfully consider uh, making the new year an impetus for you to get back in church, back with your church family if you have one. If you don't have a church family, then please uh, prayerfully consider uh, coming to truth and uh, worshiping with us. We would be honored to, to have you in service with us. I do want to let you know that on the 30th of January at 10 a.m., we're going to be celebrating our 55th homecoming. Uh, we'll have a guest speaker, Dr. Edward Moody, who's with our national office. We'll have the Gibbs family here uh, to provide some special music. Uh, they've been singing in the area for a number of years. And then naturally, we'll have a fellowship dinner to follow. And we would love to have you come and join us for this special service. So let me say to you once again, Happy New Year.